Hi, and welcome to the second of two podcasts on the muscular system. In this particular podcast, we're going to take a look at how muscles actually contract, how they shorten. And I guess we're going to look at the extreme of muscle contraction, and um, here's kind of a, I don't know, a zombie, something or other, some, something that's supposed to be dead. And what it's exhibiting is rigor mortis. This is the stiffness that happens to dead bodies um, for a certain time period after their death. If you ever watch the CSI forensic shows, the, uh, the medical examiner, the coroner will come over and they can kind of figure out when that person died based on the degree of stiffness in their body. Um, so they can say it's been 12 hours since this person has, has, has died. Um, they can do the math on that. Uh, but essentially what happens is your body, after it dies, goes through, it's, it's stuck in a state of contraction because there's no energy to release the contraction. Now eventually, um, those molecules that are stuck together and locked start to break down um, over time, just like everything does after it, passes, after it dies. And so then rigor mortis goes away. But you'll see this um, on roadkill as well. The, the arms and legs are really stiff because those muscles are contracted. But that's the extreme end of the picture. Let's take a look at how it works in something that's living. So before we dive into the actual muscle and what that looks like, put together somewhat busy flow chart here. But it makes sense if you think about it. And if you use the analogy of of the Russian nesting doll where you have a big doll and you take the head off and there's a smaller one inside and you take the head off and there's a smaller one inside and so on. So if you start with the largest scale on this slide here, we start with the whole muscle and we can break that muscle down into lots and lots of fibers. And we call those, um, these are the muscle cells, they call them fibers rather than cells. And then if you get even smaller, those fibers actually, if I show you a cross section of one, oops, they have lots of little bundles inside them. And if you pull out one of those little bundles, it's called a myofilament. Now we're almost to the important part here. If you take out one of those myofilaments and you look at it, it's like a little cylinder here, there's different bands. And each of those bands is a sarcomere. That's the smallest unit of muscle that contracts. So if we want to lift this pencil, there's a few sarcomeres that had to contract and shorten. And so those few sarcomeres make up some myofilaments, and those myofilaments make up fibers, and we finally get a whole muscle to shorten and contract. Now here's what this looks like in an actual muscle. So we see here our muscle cells coming from our bicep muscle. If we take one of those muscle cells, you can see there's our cross section of a bundle of myofilaments, and then here's our bands. Here's our different sarcomeres. Right there. That's where we're going to zoom in today. The contractile units of a muscle are sarcomeres. And so you're going to see kind of the same thing. Um, a couple different ways now. You're going to see sarcomeres and what they look like. All right, so this is one of those sarcomeres, and they're made up of two proteins. There's a thin protein called an actin right there, and a thick protein called myosin. If there's, it's thicker, it makes sense. And basically, what's going to happen for that sarcomere, that one sarcomere, to contract? To shorten is these myosins are going to attach to the actin on top, on the bottom, you know, on both sides. They're going to all attach, and that and that myosin is going to attach. So say this is my my hands, the myosin, and this is the actin. It's going to attach and swing it forward. It's going to grab a different section and swing it forward different section, swing it forward, 
again, 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 so it shortens. And it's going to keep shortening and keep shortening the actin until something tells it to stop. And so that's actually called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. The actin is literally sliding past the myosin, shortening the sarcomere. So here's what we have. And again, a different picture of the same thing. Um, the, the top picture is a before picture. This is when everything's relaxed. And you can see the after the sarcomere has shortened. And so the before and the after. Now, if it was up to myosin, it would always be attached and pushing forward actin. But we know that's not the case. Our muscles are not in a steady state of a cramp. That would be terrible. So there has to be something keeping the myosin from always wanting to slide the actin forward. So again, let's look at a different picture of um, of a sarcomere. So if I can get in right here, there is under regular relaxed conditions, there's a barrier between myosin and actin. So that myosin isn't always reaching up and trying to contract the actin. And that barrier is there under regular conditions. Now, if we want to contract our muscles, calcium has to be present. Here's what calcium does. Calcium is going to go, let's see. Calcium is going to remove that block. So as long as calcium is present, then the block is removed. Myosin can attach the actin, and everyone's happy, and we're contracting. However, the other requirement for myosin is ATP. There has to be a little bundle of energy available for the myosin to attach and swing the actin forward, release, grab a new section, ratchet it forward. If there is no ATP present, sometimes your muscles are locked like that when you're dead. It's called rigor mortis. I mentioned it earlier. If there's no ATP, the, the myosin actually can't release and relax. So those are the two major requirements for a sarcomere, to have a, a reserve of calcium and a reserve of ATP. So as soon as we get that, that signal to contract, they can do that. Now there's a couple of other minor players um, besides calcium and ATP. The first is our lungs. We need oxygen from our lungs in order to make that ATP that our sarcomeres so need. And then, hand in hand, we need some way to get the oxygen to our muscles. So we need our circulatory system to get it there. But the major other player for muscles to stimulate is the nervous system. Because if we don't have a signal for our muscles to contract, we don't have contraction. So that's what we're going to focus in on, on the next slide. How does the nervous system play a role? Well, here's a really good picture of something called a motor unit. It's just a collection of the nerve and the muscle fiber that it stimulates. And together, that one place where the muscle, let's see if I can circle it here, that's a neuromuscular junction where the nerve meets the muscle. So here's what happens. We want to move a muscle our nervous system sends a message to that particular muscle fiber, maybe a couple of them, and three in this case. And what that does is it tells your muscle cells, which have these pools of calcium reservoirs, oops, to release the calcium, just let open the floodgates. And so if there's calcium released, calcium removes the block from myosin to actin, and so myosin then swings forward and um, or attaches to actin to allow it to swing forward. As soon as the stimulus is gone from that muscle, the calcium creeps back into its little reserve pool and waits for the next stimulus. And so then the, the blockade is put back in place. Myosin cannot connect with actin, and so we have a relaxed muscle. All right, now a little bit about muscle stimulation. 
those little muscle fibers on the previous slide, they're going to contract no matter what. If they get the signal, they are going as hard as they can. Those little sarcomeres are shortening as much as they can. It just depends um, on how many sarcomeres get stimulated. For example, to lift this stylus, maybe it takes 500 sarcomeres to do that, contracting as hard as they can. But maybe lifting a 60-pound child takes 500,000 sarcomeres. No matter what, the quality of the contraction always stays the same. It's just how many are stimulated, which changes the magnitude of that contraction. Now, there are four different types of muscle contractions. The first type is a muscle twitch, like when you're falling asleep. There's a quick response to a single stimulus, and this isn't any sort of normal function for a muscle by any means. The other end of the extreme is a cramp, a tetanic contraction. And this is when your muscles are continuously bombarded with stimulus. So calcium is just flooding the cytoplasm of those sarcomeres, telling them, contract, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And it isn't until that stimulus stops that the calcium goes back into its resting tank. The other two types of muscle contractions are isotonic and isometric. Isotonic are the types of contractions you see the guys in the gyms doing their bicep curls. The muscle is shortening and doing its normal motion. Isometric, on the other hand, iso means same and metric means distance. So it actually doesn't, doesn't shorten. So this is an example of an isometric contraction. Pulling on that... Um, on that rope, pushing against the wall, you're not necessarily shortening the muscle, but you're, there's still tension. There's still contraction. Now all this talk about muscle contraction, we need calcium and we need a stimulus and we need ATP, but at some point our reserves of those are going to run low. And so we exhibit muscle fatigue. And muscle fatigue usually happens because we keep going, keep going. We don't give our muscles a chance to recoup those um, ingredients it needs to contract. And so usually the biggest culprit of muscle fatigue is that we've run out of ATP. We just can't get those myosins attached to the actin for that contraction anymore. We just don't have the raw ingredients to make it happen. The main reason for this is that we run out of oxygen. We can't get enough oxygen to our mitochondria to make ATP. So when this happens, our muscles still want to help us move and contract at all costs. So they try and find a way around it. They try and go a different route that doesn't require oxygen. And so by doing that, how they break down certain chemicals and do this pathway ends up with a really nasty byproduct called lactic acid. And so then that causes your muscles to be really sore after a workout because they're just filled with that acid. And eventually, though, the, the acid breaks down and our soreness goes away. So that was muscle contraction. Um, and, I, and I hope that you found it helpful and that you know now the difference between regular contraction and rigor mortis. Thanks for listening.